Okay, and welcome back. This is video two out of four on different types of shocks in the real business cycle model. So for this shock, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at a shock to labor supply. So there are a number of things that could lead to a shock in labor supply, right? There could be an influx of immigration, for example. There could be just people deciding they want to work. Why would they do that? Well, if you remember the reserve wage stuff that I talked about in the real business cycle model, if the reserve wage falls, right, the wage that induces someone to basically get up off their ass and go to work, if that wage falls, then you got more people that want to work more hours. Thus, you would see an increase in labor supply. So without further ado, we are going to walk through a labor supply shock. Now this one, isn't going to have as much going on as what we see with the technology shock. The technology shock in this model is definitely the most convoluted one. This one's quite a bit easier, and then the other two shocks that we're gonna look at are, well, even easier than that. So, before we go any further, what I have here, and I'll allow you to look at it in a moment, or for a moment, which you're looking at right now, what we have here is that general equilibrium I was talking about. So this is gonna be the starting point for every single uh, graphical exercise you have to do with this type of model. This is where you will always start out. So here, we have the IS and LM curves. Remember the IS curve reflects all interest rate output combinations where goods markets clear. The LM curve represents all interest rate output combinations where money markets clear. These two guys determine the aggregate demand curve. And we have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Now over here what we have is labor demand and labor supply. So we have labor markets here with the real wage rate on the vertical axis and the amount of labor being either supplied or demanded, just labor, on the horizontal axis, right? When these two guys intersect, labor market's clear, we have an equilibrium wage rate, W star. Down here, once the labor markets have cleared, firms know exactly how much labor they're gonna get, right? We can trace this over, and this is the amount of output that we will get, because here's the production function, output, as a function of labor. So once we know how much labor is going to be used, boom, it goes into this production function, spits out Y star. We trace this all the way over to this 45 degree line, which reflects it, like flips it, right? And then we can basically, what was on the vertical axis is now on the horizontal axis, so we can trace it up to a vertical aggregate supply curve. Now these two guys right here intersect at a point of output where aggregate demand and aggregate supply intersect. When these two guys intersect, we get an equilibrium real interest rate, R star. And when aggregate demand and aggregate supply intersect, we get an equilibrium price level, P star. So this is where we will always be starting. Now we're going to impose a labor supply shock. What happens? Well, if there's a labor supply shock, well, that means that there's a shock to labor supply. So labor supply, LTS, shifts. Now we can either have a positive or a negative labor supply shock, right? This is a model with that's linear in parameters. So whatever, if we have a positive or a negative shock, all we do is just flip the signs of the way all these variables will be responding. Right, so labor supply shifts. Well, if labor supply shifts, we're good, we'll say it just shifts to the right. Right, it shifts out. All right, well, if you remember, labor supply is a function L, and the wage rate and that theta. What was that theta? Well, that theta was really the source of all 
all these different shocks. Actually, I take that back. It wasn't theta. It was HT. My mistake. I am so sorry about that. HT is the source of labor supply shocks. So if there's any change in preferences, right? People decide they want to work more, right? The, um, is that lovely when your brain dies? The reserve wage drops, right? If the reserve wage drops, that's a drop in preferences for the agent, right? So if there's a reduction in the reserve wage, it'll show up in HT. If there's a, an influx of immigration, well, that shows up through HT. If HT increases, labor supply will increase. Like this. All right, you can just say it shifts to the right or it shifts up. Take your pick. All right, so if HT goes up, labor supply shifts. Well, the increase in labor supply, what we get is doing that so I don't screw up this marker tip. You can say it shifts over to LTS prime. That's great. Like that. Well, when that shifts out, what happens? Well, first off, there's no change to labor demand. So if labor demand isn't changing, the labor supply is, then what happens is the real wage rate is going to decline. And now we trace this down to the production curve. And we stop at this point right here. Trace this over. And output's going to increase a little bit. Now, why is output not increasing more? Because before what we saw was that shift in this production function. But there isn't a shift in that production function here. Why isn't there? Well, if you look at the axes, Y and L, right, and L is what's changing. The source of the shock is originating in labor supply. Well, labor, labor supply, right, labor is an input in the production function. So if we change something that is an input in the production function that is defined along this axis here, we don't shift the curve. There's nowhere to shift that curve because we just moved to a new point on the existing curve. So we just trace this blue dotted line down. And we just make a little note that labor increases, right? But now what we need to do is draw this dotted line over and then up. Where we can see that there is a shift in the aggregate supply curve. Now, when there's a shift, a rightward shift in the aggregate supply curve along a downward sloping aggregate demand curve that is not moving, we're going to see a reduction in the price level. So the price level falls from PT star to PT prime. But then we've got to trace this guy up, just like we did before. All right, we're going to trace it up to the IS curve. which means that there's going to be a shift in the LM curve. Because remember, as prices increase, the LM curve is, or sorry, as prices decrease, the LM curve is going to shift out. And as it shifts out along this IS curve, which isn't going anywhere, well, we're going to get a reduction in the real interest rate. 
And this would be the graphical predicted response of a labor supply shock in the real business cycle model. All right, so let's summarize. Let's look at what happened here, right? The source of the shock was H sub T. All right, whatever the reason was, that was the source of the shock. So here, H sub T increases. Once H sub T increases, then we kind of have to look and sort of take stock of which variables moved and in which direction they moved. All right, well, if H T goes up, labor is going to increase. But because labor supply increased, the real wage rate falls, right? Because labor supply is shifting along a downward sloping labor demand curve. So the real wage rate falls. But because labor increased, output goes up. And because output goes up and shifts along a downward sloping aggregate demand curve, the price level drops. So PT drops. All right, we're almost done here. What's the last thing that we got to look at? Well, let's look at the real interest rate. All right, the real interest rate here falls. So as you can see, looking at this, right, we have a set of qualitative responses that indicate what happens when there's a labor supply shock. And now that we've talked about two different types of shocks, let's talk about identification because identification is something that's relatively important here. What do I mean by identification? What I mean by identification is being able to uniquely identify shocks based on the way these variables respond. Basically, do they move in different directions in some shocks than in others? Because if they don't... Um, if they move in the same direction as other types of shocks and we can't identify what the difference is. Right? We can't tell what the difference is. So let's compare this to what we had to a technology shock. Right? When there was a technology shock, HT didn't increase. What increased was AT. Right? But when AT increased, remember the production curve shifted up. There was a labor demand shock rather than a labor supply shock. Or I should say rather a shift in labor demand rather than a shift in labor supply. So if AT goes up, output increases labor increases, wages increase. Actually, you know what I'll do? I'm going to get this lined up just right with these right here. So when there's a shock to technology, we see labor increase. Similarly, we see wages increase because there's a shift in labor demand rather than a shift in labor supply. So wages increase. Output goes up. Output goes up, aggregate supply shifts to the right, just like what we saw under the labor supply shock, right? It just doesn't shift by as much in the labor supply shock. Remember, when we had the shift in the output curve, this guy went a lot further to the right. So the response, when we think about magnitudes, I know I said like magnitudes weren't a big deal, they're a little bit of a big deal. 
kind of, sort of, not really. In this case, it's a little bit more of a big deal because if we were to shift this production curve up, we would see a larger response in the movement of aggregate supply. But just in terms of qualitative responses, right? Output goes up, aggregate supply shifts out along a downward sloping aggregate demand curve, so the price level has to fall, right? And then there's a movement in the LM curve because the price level fell, and because the price level fell, the real interest rate falls. So this is what we get. Because if we hold the nominal interest rate fixed, the nominal interest rate doesn't change and the price level falls, what does that mean about the real interest rate? Well, the real interest rate is also going to fall. And that right there allows us to compare the differences between a labor supply shock and a technology shock. So, if we look at these, labor goes up, labor goes up. Okay, so, so far we can't tell the difference. Right, if we just look at labor, we can't tell the difference between a labor supply and a technology shock. But let's look at wages. Wages go up under a technology shock, they go down under a labor supply shock. So we can check that one off, there is a difference there. Output, well those two move in the same direction, prices move in the same direction, real interest rate moves in the same direction. But there is one difference, right, there's one difference in terms of the qualitative responses we would expect to see under these two different types of shocks, which means we can so far, based on two of the four shocks that we've looked at, we can so far uniquely identify these two types of shocks. So of these two shocks that we've got, two of the four, we're halfway there. We're halfway there and we can uniquely identify these two different types of shocks, right? So now, next thing that we're going to want to talk about here is, well, practice this just like you practiced the other type of shock, right? Work on this over and over and over. Right, try not to look at your notes, try not to watch the videos, but just work on this on your own until you get it right. It shouldn't take you very long because there really aren't very many movements. And if you've watched the video where I set this stuff up and I explained how aggregate demand is derived and you remember the relationship between prices and the LM curve, you should remember basically if prices ever drop, the LM curve is going to shift out.